That's probably the best introduction I've ever gotten. <laughs> <laughs> but I don't know if I'm supposed to say something shocking. I don't know whether this is the right crowd for, for anarchy. So I think that instead I'm just going to recite every do joke that David Gordon has ever told me. <laughs> <laughs> well, no, no, maybe not. Maybe I'll, I'll stick with the anarchy. <laughs> well, you can easily get them. <laughs> Okay, so well, what I'm going to do, uh, and some of you may have heard uh, uh, Dr. Hoppus talk uh, earlier. Um, I didn't get to hear it because I was scheduled opposite it. So uh, who knows what he said? He may have changed his mind and come out uh, against anarchy. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but anyway, I just want to talk about some of the uh, main objections that have been uh, given to uh, libertarian anarchism and uh, my attempts to answer them. But before I start giving objections, there's no and try to answer them, there's no point trying to answer objections to a view unless you've given some reason positive reason to hold a view in the first place. Uh so uh I just want to say briefly what I think the uh the positive case is for it before going on to defend uh it against objections. Uh think about it this way. What's wrong with a shoe monopoly? Suppose that I and my gang are the only ones that are legally allowed to uh, manufacture and sell shoes. And you know, my gang and anyone else that I authorize, but nobody else. What's wrong with it? Well, first of all, from a moral point of view, the question is, well, why us? What's so special about us? Now, in this case, because I've chosen me, it, you know, it is more plausible that I ought to have that kind of monopoly. But, you know, so maybe I should pick a different example. But, but still, you know, you might wonder, what, you know, what's, you know, you know, where do I and my gang get off uh, claiming this right to you know, make and sell something that no one else has the right to make and sell, to provide a good or service no one else has the right to? I mean, uh, at least as far as you know, I'm just a, another mortal, another human like unto yourselves, more or less. Uh, and so, as from a moral standpoint, I have no more uh, you know, right to do it than anyone else. Then, of course, from a, you know, from a pragmatic, consequentialist standpoint, well, first of all, what is the likely result of my having, uh, my and my gang having a monopoly on shoes? Well, first of all, there are incentive problems. If I'm the only person who has the right to make and sell shoes, you're probably not going to get the shoes from me very cheaply. You know, I can charge as much as I want, as long as I don't charge so much that you just can't afford it at all, or you decide, you know, you, you, you're happier just not having the shoes, but as long as you're willing and able, you know, I'll charge the highest price that I can get out of you, uh, because you've got no competition, you know, where else to go. You also should, probably shouldn't expect the shoes to be of particularly high quality, because after all, uh, you know, as long as they're barely serviceable, you, you still prefer them to going barefoot, you know, then you have to buy them from me. And also, in addition to the likelihood that the shoes are going to be expensive and not very good, there's also the fact that my ability to be the only person who makes and sells shoes gives me a certain leverage over you. You know, suppose that I don't like you. Suppose you've offended me in some way. Well, maybe you just don't get shoes for a while. You know, or, um, so there's also, you know, abuse of power issues. But it's not just the incentive problem, because after all, you know, suppose that I'm a, you know, a perfect saint and I will, you know, make the best shoes I possibly can for you, and I'll charge the lowest price I possibly uh, can charge, and I won't abuse my power at all. Suppose I'm utterly trustworthy. I'm a prince among men, not in Machiavelli sense. But <laughs> <laughs> there's still a problem, which is, well, how do I know exactly that I'm doing the best job I can with these shoes? Um, you know, after all, there's no competition, so. And I guess I can poll people and try to find out what they, see, you know, what kind of shoes they seem to want. But uh, you know, there are, you know, there are lots of different ways I could make shoes, and some of them are more expensive ways of making them, and some are less expensive. And uh, you know, how do I know, uh, given that there's no market, uh, and uh, there's, you know, there's really no, you know, that much I can do in the way of lo profit and loss accounting. I just have to make guesses. And so even if I'm doing my best, the shoes may not really be. Uh, you know, the, the quantity I make, the quality I make, really not, may not be best suited to satisfy people's preferences, and I have a hard time finding these things out. So those are all reasons not to have a monopoly in the making and selling of shoes. Now, prima facie, at least, it seems as though those are all good reasons not to have, for anyone not to have a monopoly in the provision of services of adjudicating disputes and protecting rights and all the things that are involved in what you might broadly call the enterprise of law. 
Uh, first of all, there's the moral question, you know, why does one gang of people get the right to be the only ones in a given territory who can uh, offer certain kinds of legal services or enforce certain kinds of things? And then there are these economic questions, uh, you know, what are the incentives going to be? And once again, it's a monopoly. Uh, it seems likely that with a captive audience, a captive uh, customer base, they're going to charge higher prices than they uh, otherwise would, offer lower quality. There might even be the occasional abuse of power. And then even if you, you know, manage to avoid all those problems and you get you know, all the saintly types into the government, uh, there's still a problem of you know, how do they know that the particular way that they're providing legal services, the particular mix of legal services they're offering, the particular ways they do it, are really uh, the best ones. Um, they just, you know, they just try and figure out what will work and they do it, but they, you know, they have, there's, since there's no competition, they don't have much way of knowing whether what they're doing is the most successful thing they could be doing. So, uh, the purpose of those considerations is to put the burden of proof on the uh, opponent. So this is the point then where the opponent of uh, competition and legal services uh, has to raise some objections. Uh, now, uh, one objection that's sometimes raised uh, is this isn't so much an objection to anarchism as an objection to uh, the you know, moral argument for anarchism is, well look, it's not really a coercive monopoly. It's not as though uh, people are, you know, people haven't consented to this because there's a certain sense in which people have consented to uh, the existing system. Uh, by, because, you know, by living within the borders of a particular territory, by accepting the benefits the government offers and so forth, they have, in effect, uh, consented. You know, just as uh, if you walk into a, a restaurant and sit down and say, I'll have the steak, you don't have to explicitly mention that you're agreeing to pay for it. It's just sort of understood that by sitting down in the restaurant and ordering the, and asking for the steak, you are agreeing to pay for it. Uh, you know, but likewise, the argument goes, if you, you know, sit down in the territory of this given state and you uh, accept benefits of police protection or something, then uh, you've implicitly agreed uh, to uh, abide by its requirements. Now, notice that even if this argument works, it doesn't settle the question, it doesn't settle the pragmatic question of whether uh, this is the best working system. But I think that there's something dubious about this argument. Uh, you know, because it's certainly true that if I, I mean, I, if I go go into someone else's territory, if I go into someone else's property, then you know, it seems like there's an expectation that well, as long as I'm on their property, I have to do as they say, and I have to follow their rules. And if I don't want to follow their rules, then I got to leave. So uh, you know, I invite you over to my house. When you come in, I say, you know, you have to wear the funny hat. And you say, well, what's this? And I say, well, that's the way it works in my house. Is everyone has to wear the funny hat. Those are my rules. Well, you know, you you can't say, you know, I won't wear the hat, but I'm staying anyway. You know, these are my rules. They may be dumb rules, but I can do it. But now suppose that uh, you're at home having dinner, and I'm your next door neighbor, and I come in, knock on your door, and you open the door, and I come in, and I say, you have to wear the funny hat, and. <laughs> You say, why is this? I say, well, you moved in next door to me, didn't you? And uh, so by doing that, you sort of agreed. And you said, well, wait a second. Uh, you know, when did I agree to this? Um, I think that the assumption is, that the implicit assumption here is you're, that the person who makes this argument is already assuming that the government has some legitimate jurisdiction over this territory. And then they say, well, now anyone who's in the territory is therefore agreeing uh, to the prevailing rules. But uh, they're assuming the very thing they're trying to prove, namely that this jurisdiction over the territory is legitimate. If it's not, then the government is just sort of one more group of people living in this broad general geographical territory. But, you know, I've got my property, and exactly what their arrangements are, I don't know, but here I am on my property, and they don't own it. Uh, at least they haven't given me any argument that they do. And so, you know, the fact that you know, I'm living in this country means I'm living in a certain geographical region that they have certain, you know, pretensions over, but the question is whether those pretensions are legitimate, and you can't assume it without proving it. Uh, I mean, you can't assume it before, uh, in the, uh, as a means to proving it. And, uh, and of course, another thing it's, you know, the problem with these, one problem with these implicit social contract arguments is it's not clear what the contract is. I mean, in the case of of ordering food in a restaurant, you know, everyone pretty much knows what, you know, what the 
contract is. So you could run an implicit consent argument there, but you know, no one would suggest that you could, uh, you know, you could buy a house the same way. Uh, you know, there are all these rules or things like that. You know, when it's something complicated, no one just says, you know, well, you just sort of agreed by nodding your head at some point or something. Uh, you have to find out what's the, what is actually in the contract. What are you agreeing to? And it's not clear what the, if the, no one knows what the, exactly the details of the contract are, it's not that persuasive. Okay, well, most of the arguments are going to talk about a pragmatic uh, or a mixture of moral and pragmatic. Probably the most famous argument against anarchy is Hobbes. Uh, Hobbes' argument is, well, look, uh, human cooperation, social cooperation, requires a structure of law in the background. Uh, the reason we can trust each other to cooperate is because we know that there are legal forces that will, you know, punish us if if we violate each other's rights. And the fact that I know that uh, they'll punish me if I violate your rights, but it'll also punish you if you violate my rights. And so I can trust you because I don't have to rely on your own personal character. I just have to rely on the fact that you'll be intimidated by the law. So social cooperation requires this legal framework backed up by the force of the state. Well, Hobbes is assuming several things at once here. First, he's assuming that there can't be any social cooperation without law. Second, he's assuming that there can't be any law unless it's enforced uh, by physical force. And third, he's assuming you can't have law enforced by physical force unless it's done by a monopoly state. But all those assumptions are false. Uh, it's certainly true that cooperation can and does emerge, maybe not as efficiently as it would with law, but without law. I mean, there's Robert Ellickson's book, Order Without Law, where he talks about how neighbors manage to resolve disputes uh, about uh, he talks all those examples about what happens if one farmer's cow wanders into another farmer's territory and uh, they solve it through some kind of mutual customary agreements and so forth and there's no legal uh, framework for resolving it. Um, you know, maybe that's not enough for a complex uh, economy, but it certainly uh, shows that you can have some kind of cooperation without an actual legal framework. Second, you can, you can have a legal framework that isn't backed up by force. An example would be the law merchant in the late Middle Ages, a system of commercial law that was backed up by threats of boycott. And, you know, boycott isn't an act of force, but still, you've got merchants making all these uh, these contracts, and uh, if you don't abide by the contract, then you know the court just publicizes to everyone this person didn't abide by the contract. Take that into account if you are going to make another contract with them. And third, you can have formal legal systems that do use force that are not monopolistic. Um, and, you know, since Hobbes doesn't even consider that possibility, he doesn't really give any argument against it. Uh, but you can uh, uh, certainly see examples in, uh, in history, the history of, of medieval Iceland, for example, where there was no one center of enforcement. In fact, there, there, although there was something you might perhaps call a government, uh, it had no executive arm at all. It had no, you know, no police, no soldiers, no nothing. It had, uh, it had sort of a, a competitive, uh, court system. Um, but then enforcement was just up to, uh, whoever. And there were systems that were involved for taking care of that. Okay, well, more interesting arguments are from Locke. Locke argues that anarchy involves three things he calls inconveniences. Uh, an inconvenience, you know, has a somewhat more weighty sound in 17th century English than it does in, in, uh, modern English, but still his point in calling it inconveniences, which still is a bit weaker, is Locke thought that social cooperation could exist somewhat uh, under anarchy. He was more optimistic than Hobbes was. He thought on the basis of moral sympathies on the one hand and self-interest on the other, cooperation could emerge. But he thought that there were three problems. Uh, one problem, he said, was that uh, there isn't, you know, there, there wouldn't be a general body of law that was generally known and agreed on and understood. So that people could grasp certain basic principles of the law of nature. But their applications in precise detail are always going to be controversial. You know, even libertarians don't agree on, you know, they can agree on general things, but, you know, we're always arguing with each other about various points of fine detail. So, you know, even a society of, of peaceful, cooperative libertarians, there's going to be disagreements about details. And so unless there's some general body of law that everyone knows about so that they can know what they can count on being able to do and what not, it's not going to, uh, it's not going to work. So that was Locke's first argument. There has to be a general 
a generally known universal body of law that applies to everyone that everyone knows about ahead of time. Second, uh, there is a, uh, a power of enforcement problem. We thought that uh, that uh, without a government, you don't have sufficient uh, sufficiently unified power to enforce. You just have sort of individuals enforcing things on their own, and they're just too weak. They're not organized enough. They could be overrun by a gang of bandits or something. Third, Locke said, problem is that there's uh, the problem that people can't be trusted to be judges in their own case. If two people have a disagreement, and one of them says, well, I know what the law of nature is, and I'm going to enforce it on you, well, people tend to be biased, and they're going to find most plausible the, the interpretation of the law of nature that favors their own case. So he thought that you can't, you can't trust people to be judges in their own case, therefore you have to, uh, therefore they should be morally required to submit their disputes to an arbitrator. Maybe in cases of emergency they can still defend themselves on the spot, but you know, for other cases where it's not a matter of immediate self-defense, they need to delegate this to an arbitrator, a third party, and that's the state. Well, so Locke thinks that these are three problems you have under anarchy and that you wouldn't have them under government, or at least under the right kind of government. But I think that's actually the, exactly the other way around. I think that, that anarchy can solve all three of those problems and that the state, by its very nature, cannot possibly solve them. Uh, so let's first take the case of uh, universality, of having a universally known and uh, you know, body of law that people can know ahead of time and count on. Um, now, can that emerge in a non-state system? Well, in fact, it did emerge in the law merchant precisely because the states were not providing it. Uh, one of the things that helped to bring about the emergence of the law merchant is the individual uh, states in Europe each had different sets of, of laws governing, merchant, uh, governing merchants. And, each, and they're all different. And a court in, in France wouldn't uphold a contract made in England under the laws of England, and vice versa. And so the merchant's ability to engage in international trade was hampered by the fact that there, were, you know, there wasn't any uniform system of commercial law for all of Europe. So the merchants got together and said, well, let's just make some of our own. You know, the courts are coming up with these crazy rules, and they're all different, and they won't respect each other's decisions. We'll just ignore them, and we'll set up our own system. So this is a case in which, the, in which uniformity and predictability were produced by the market, not by the state. And you can see why that's not surprising. It's in the interest of those who are providing a private system to make it uniform and predictable if that's what the customers need. Uh, it's for the same reason that you don't find any triangular ATM cards. As far as I know, there's no law saying that you can't have a triangular ATM card, but anyone tried to market them, they just wouldn't be very popular because they wouldn't fit in the existing machines. So they, um, you know, the, the systems are made, you know, when what, the, when what people need is diversity, when what people need is different systems for different people, the market provides that. But there are some things where uniformity is, you know, is better, that uh, you know, your ATM card is more valuable to you if everyone else is using the same kind as well, or kind compatible with it, so that you can all use the machines wherever you go. And therefore, the merchants are going to, if they want to make a profit, they're going to provide uniformity. So the market has an incentive to provide uniformity in a way that government doesn't necessarily. Uh, uh, on the question of uh, power, you know, having sufficient power of organizing for defense, well, the, uh, there's no reason you can't have organization uh, under anarchy. Uh, there's no reason that people can't, you know, the anarchy doesn't mean that each person, you know, makes their own shoes. Uh, you know, the alternative to government providing all the shoes is not that each person makes their own shoes. Uh, so likewise, the alternative to government providing all the legal services is not that each person, you know, has to be their own independent uh, policeman. Uh, there's no reason that they can't organize in various ways. Uh, and uh, in fact, if you're worried about not having sufficient force to resist an aggressor, well, a monopoly government is a much more dangerous aggressor than just you know some gang of bandits or other, because it's sort of you know it's unified all this power in one in just in one point in the whole society. And I think most interestingly, the argument about being uh, a judge in your own case, I think really boomerangs against Locke's argument here. Because first of all, it's not a good argument for a monopoly, because it's a fallacy to argue from everyone should submit their disputes to a third party, to there should be a third party that everyone submits their disputes to. You know, that's like arguing from everyone likes at least one TV show to there's at least one TV show that everyone likes. And it just doesn't follow. 
you can have everyone submitting their disputes to third parties without there being some one third party that everyone disputes. You know, suppose you've got three people on an island. A and B can submit their disputes to C, and A and C can submit their disputes to B, and uh, B and C can submit their disputes to A. So you don't need a, uh, a monopoly in order to embody this principle that people should submit their disputes to a third party. But moreover, not only do you not need a government, but a government is precisely what doesn't satisfy that principle. Because the gov if you have a dispute with the government, the government doesn't submit that dispute to a third party. Uh, the government, if you have a dispute with the government, it'll be settled in a government court. Well, if you're lucky, if you're unlucky, it'll be, you know, you know, if you live under one of the, you know, one of the more uh, rough and ready governments, we will never even get as far as a court. But, um, but if it's settled in a government court, you know, now, of course, it's better if the government itself, you know, divided checks and balances and so forth. That's a little bit better. It's closer to there being third parties, but still they are all part of the same system, and the judges are paid by tax money and so forth. So it's not as though uh, you can't have sort of better and worse approximations to this principle among different kinds of governments. But still, as long as it's a monopoly system, it, by its nature, it's in a certain sense lawless. It never, it never ultimately submits its disputes to a third party. Uh, probably the most popular argument uh, against libertarian anarchy is, well, what happens if, uh, and this is Ayn Rand's famous argument, is what happens if, uh, you know, I think you've violated my rights and you think you haven't, and so I call up my protection agency, you call up your protection agency, and uh, you know, why won't they just do battle? What guarantees that they won't do battle? Which, of course, the answer is, well, nothing guarantees they won't do battle. I mean, human beings have free will. They can do all kinds of crazy things. They might, you know, they might go to battle. You know, likewise, uh, you know, George Bush might decide to push the nuclear button tomorrow. I mean, you know, they might do all sorts of things. The question is, what's likely? Uh, which is likelier to settle its disputes uh, through violence, a government or a private protection agency? Well, the difference is that... Uh, Private protection agencies have to bear the costs of their own decisions to go to war. Uh, going to war is expensive. If you have a choice between two protection agencies, and one solves its disputes through violence most of the time, and the other one solves its disputes through arbitration most of the time, you, know, you might think, oh, I want the one that solves its disputes through violence. That sounds really cool. Um, <laughs> but then you, you, know, you look at your monthly premiums, and you think, well, you know, you know, how committed are you to the, you know, to this Viking mentality? Uh, now you might, you might be so committed to the Viking mentality that you're willing to you know, to pay for it, but still, you know, it is more expensive, and a lot of customers are going to be going to say, well, I want, I want to go to one that, uh, you know, doesn't charge, you know, all this extra amount for the violence. Whereas, you know, uh, governments can simply, you know. First of all, they've got captive customers. They can't go anywhere else. Besides, they're taxing the customers anyway. Um, and so the customers don't have the option to switch to a different agency. And so governments can externalize the costs if they're going to war much more effectively than private agencies can. Uh, one common objection, and this is one that you find, for example, uh, in Robert Bidinato, who's a Randy and has written a number of articles uh, against anarchy, and I've, he and I have had sort of a running debate online about this. Uh, his principal objection to anarchy is that under anarchy there's no final arbiter in disputes. Under government, there's finally, you know, some final arbiter at some point comes along and resolves the dispute one way or the other. But under anarchy, you know, there's no, since there's no one agency that's, that has the right to settle things for once and for all, there's no final arbiter, and so disputes in some sense never end. They never get resolved. They always remain open-ended. So, what's the answer to that? Well, I think that there's an ambiguity in the concept here of a final arbiter. By a final arbiter, you could mean a final arbiter in what I call the platonic sense. That is to say, someone or something or some institution that somehow absolutely guarantees that the dispute is resolved forever. Uh, it absolutely guarantees the resolution. Uh, or instead, by final arbiter, you could mean simply mean some person or process or institution or something or other that more or less reliably guarantees most of the time that these problems get resolved. Now it is true that in the platonic sense of an absolute guarantee of a final arbiter, in that sense anarchy does not provide one, but neither does any other system. Uh, you know, take, take a minarchist constitutional republic of the sort that Bernardo favors. Is there a final arbiter under that system? 
in the sense of something that absolutely guarantees ending the process forever uh, of dispute. Well, you know, I sue you, uh, or I, uh, you know, I, or I've been sued, or I am accused of something, whatever. I'm in some kind of court case. I lose. I appeal it. Uh, I appeal to the Supreme Court. They go against me. I lobby the Congress to change the laws to favor me. They don't do it. Um, so then I, uh, you know, I try to get a movement for a constitutional amendment going. Uh, you know, that fails. So I try and get people together to to vote in new people in Congress who will vote. I mean, you know, in some sense, it can go on forever. The dispute isn't over. Uh, but as a matter of fact, most of the time, most legal disputes eventually end up. You know, someone just finds it too costly to continue fighting, and they, you know, it's, so likewise under anarchy. Of course, there's no guarantee that the conflict won't go on forever. Uh, you know, there are very few guarantees of that ironclad sort. Uh, but uh, that's uh, no reason not to uh, expect it to work. Another uh, popular argument, uh, also used often by the Randians, is that market exchanges presuppose a background of property law. You know, if you know, you and I can't be making exchanges of goods for services or money for services or whatever unless there's already a stable background of property law that ensures us the property titles that we have. And because the market in order to function presupposes existing background property law, therefore that property law cannot itself be the product of the market. The property law must emerge I think they must really think it must emerge out of, you know, out of a infallible robot or something. But I know it's not clear what it emerges from. But someone can't emerge from the market. But they're thinking this is sort of like, well, first there's this property law, and it's all, it's all put in place, and you know, no market transactions are happening. Everyone's just waiting for all the the, the uh, whole legal structure to be put in place, and then it's in place, and now we can finally start trading back and forth. I mean, it's certainly it's true that you can't have functioning markets without a functioning legal system. That's true. But it's not as though first the legal system's in place and then on the last day they finally finish putting the legal system together then people begin their trading. Uh, these things arise together. Legal institutions and economic trade uh, you know, arise together in one of the same place at one of the same time. And uh, the uh, a legal system is not something independent of the activity it constrains. After all, remember, legal system again. It's not, it's not a robot or a god or something separate from us. The, le the existence of the legal system consists in people obeying it. If everyone ignored the legal system, it would have no power at all. Uh, so it's only because people generally go along with it that it survives. So the legal system too depends on on voluntary uh, support. And that, you know, I think that a lot of people. One reason that they're scared of anarchy is they think that under government it's as though the, there's some kind of guarantee under government that's taken away under anarchy. That somehow there's this background, this firm background we can always fall back on, and under anarchy it's just gone. But the firm background is just the product of people interacting and the people interacting with the incentives that they have. Uh, I mean, likewise, when when anarchists say, "Well, look, you can, you know, if, if people." Under anarchy, you would probably have the incentive to do this or that. And people say, well, that's not good enough. I don't really want, just want it to be likely that they'll have the incentive to do this. I want the government to absolutely guarantee that they'll do it. But the government is just people. And depending on what the constitutional structure of that government is, it's likely that they'll do this or that. Uh, you know, you can't design a constitution that will guarantee that the people in the government will behave in any particular way. You can structure it in such a way that they're more likely to do this or less likely to do this. Uh, and you can see anarchy is kind of a, you know, just an extension of checks and balances to, uh, uh, to a, more, a broader level. And for example, when people say, well, you know, what guarantees that the different branches of, I mean, the different agencies will resolve things in any particular way? Well, the, the U.S. Constitution says nothing about what happens if different branches of the government disagree about how to resolve things. It doesn't say what, ha what happens if, if uh, the Supreme Court thinks something is unconstitutional, but Congress thinks it doesn't and wants to go ahead and do it anyway. It famously doesn't say what happens if there's a dispute between the states and the federal government. Uh, yeah. So you know, our, the, the current uh, system where once the Supreme Court declares something unconstitutional, 
then the you know the Congress doesn't uh, and the president don't try to do it anymore at least not quite so much um, uh, that didn't always exist remember when when the court declared what, what Andrew Jackson was doing unconstitutional uh, when he was president he just said well they've made the decision let them enforce it uh, which uh, and the Constitution doesn't say whether you know whether Willie Jackson did it was the right way or whether but the way we do it now is a, a way that's emerged through custom you know maybe you're for it maybe you're against it whatever it is it was never codified in law one objection is that uh, under anarchy organized crime will take over well it might you know uh, but is it likely organized crime gets its power uh, because it specializes in things that are illegal, things like drugs and prostitution and so forth. You know, during the years when alcohol was prohibited, organized crime specialized in the alcohol trade. You know, nowadays, you know, they're not so big in the alcohol trade. So the power of organized crime, you know, you know, to a large extent depends on the power of government. It's sort of a parasite on government's activities. Uh, government, governments are banning things, create black markets, and uh, black markets are sort of dangerous things to be in because you have to worry, uh, you know, both about the government and about, you know, other dodgy people who are going into the uh, black market uh, field. And so it, organized crime specializes in that. Uh, so organized crime, I think, would be weaker, not stronger uh, in the libertarian system. Another worry is that the rich would rule. After all, you'd say, well, won't justice just go to the highest bidder in that case? Um, uh, if uh, if you turn uh, legal services into uh, an economic good, that's a common objection. Uh, in fact, interestingly, it's a, uh, a particularly common objection among uh, Randians. who suddenly become very concerned about the about the poor, impoverished masses. <laughs> uh, but um, but under which system are the rich more powerful? Under the current system or under anarchy? I mean, certainly you've always got some sort of advantage if you're rich. I mean, it's good to be rich. Uh, you know, you're always in a better position to bribe people if you're rich than if you're not. And that's, that's true. Uh, but under, under the current system, the power of the rich is magnified. Because, you know, suppose, uh, suppose that I'm a, you know, an evil rich person. And I want to get the government to do something or other that costs a million dollars. Do I have to bribe some bureaucrat a million dollars to get it done? No, because I'm not asking him to do it with his own money. Obviously, if I'm asking him to do it with his own money, I couldn't get him to spend a, a million dollars by bribing him any less than a million. Uh, it'd have to be at least a million dollars and one cent. Uh, but, uh, you know, people who control tax money that they don't themselves personally own and therefore can't do whatever they want with, uh, you know, the bureau can't, can't just pocket the million and go home, although sometimes they get surprisingly close to that, but they can't really. <laughs> but, all I have to do is, you know, I bribe him a few thousand, and he can direct the, you know, this million dollars in tax money to my favorite project or whatever, and thus, you know, my the power of my bribe money is multiplied. Whereas if he were the head of some private protection agency, and I'm trying to get him to do something that cost a million dollars, uh, I'd have to bribe him, you know, more than a million. So the, you know, the power of the rich is, is actually less under this system. And of course, a, uh, you know, it's a any court that got the, reputation of uh, discriminating in favor of millionaires against poor people would also have presumably have the reputation of discriminating uh, for billionaires against millionaires and so uh, the millionaires would not want to you know deal with it all the time they'd only want to deal with it when they're dealing with, with the people poorer not people richer and the reputation effects yeah I don't think this would be uh, too popular an outfit worries about uh, poor victims who uh, can't afford uh, legal services, or victims who die without heirs. Again, you know, the Randians are very worried about victims dying without heirs. Uh, but uh, the, in the case of uh, poor victims, uh, you can do what they did in medieval Iceland. If you're uh, too poor to uh, you know, to purchase legal services, still, if someone has, has harmed you, you have a claim to compensation from that person. You can sell that claim, or part of the claim, or all of the claim to someone else. Uh, actually, it's kind of like um, hiring a lawyer on a contingency fee basis, uh, and uh, you can sell it to someone who is in a position to uh, enforce your claim. Or if you die, you might say that if you die without heirs, in the sense you're, you know, you you died, one of the goods you left behind was your claim to compensation, and that can be uh, homesteaded. 
Another worry that Bettinato has is, this is sort of the opposite of the worry that the rich will rule, is, well, look, isn't Mises right that the market is like a big democracy where, you know, consumer sovereignty, the masses get whatever they want. Uh, and that's great when it's, you know, refrigerators and cars and so forth. But surely that's not a good thing when it's laws. Uh, because after all, the masses are a bunch of, you know, ignorant, intolerant fools. And, you know, if they, if they, they get, get whatever laws they want, who knows what horrible things they will, uh, uh, make. Of course, the, um, the difference, once again, and the difference between economic democracy and of the Mises sort and political democracy is, well, yeah, you know, they get whatever they want, but they're going to have to pay for it. Now, it's perfectly true that, you know, if you have people who are, you know, fanatical enough about wanting to impose some wretched thing on other people, uh, if you've got a large enough group of people who are fanatical enough about this, you know, then you know, anarchy might not lead to uh, libertarian results, you know. If you've got, you know, if you're living in California, you've got enough people who are, you know, absolutely fanatical about banning smoking, or maybe if you're in Alabama, and it's homosexuality instead of smoking, uh, they want to ban. Uh, neither one would ban the other, I think. But um, <laughs> uh, in that case, uh, you know, it might happen that they're so fanatical about it that they would ban it. But remember that they are going to have to be paying for this. And so when you get your monthly premium, you say, well, you see, well, here's your basic service. Uh, of, of, you know, basically bring, you know, protecting you against aggression. Oh, and then here's also your extended service and the extra fee for that of, you know, peering in your neighbor's windows to make sure that they're not, you know, either the tobacco or the homosexuality or whatever it is you're worried about. Um, <laughs> and, uh, you know, now the really fanatical people will say, yes, I'm going to shell out the extra money for this. But, uh, not, but if you're not so fanatical, then the, but of course, if, if they're that fanatical, they're probably going to be in trouble under minarchy too. But if they're, if they're not that fanatical, they'll say, well, you know, if all I had to do is go into a voting booth and vote for these, you know, for these laws, uh, you know, restricting other people's freedom, well, heck, I'd go in, it's, you know, it's pretty easy to go in and vote for it. But if I actually have to pay for it, gee, I don't know. Maybe I can <laughs> reconcile myself to, to this. Okay, one last, uh, one last consideration. I want to talk about, and uh, this is a question that originally was raised by Nozick, Robert Nozick, and has then since been pushed farther by Tyler Cowen. Uh, Nozick said, well, look, suppose you have anarchy, one of three things will happen. Either they will fight, either the agencies will fight, and he gives two different scenarios of what will happen if they fight, but I've already talked about what happens if they fight, so I'll talk about the th third option. What if they don't fight? Then he says, well, what if instead they, you know, they agree to these mutual arbitration contracts and so forth? Then basically this whole thing just turns into a government. Uh, and then Tyler Cowen has pushed this argument farther. And he said, well, look, what happens is basically this forms into a cartel. And it's going to be in the interest of this cartel to sort of turn itself into a government. And any new agency that comes along, uh, they can just boycott it. Um, and, you know, just as it's in your, uh, it's in your interest, uh, you know, if you come along with a new ATM card, it's in your interest that your card is compatible with everyone else's machines. So if you're coming along as a brand new protection agency, it's in your interest that, that you get to be part of this system of contracts and, uh, and arbitration and so forth that the existing ones have. Consumers aren't going to come to you if they find out that you don't have any agreements as to what happens if you're in a conflict with these other agencies. And so this cartel will, will be able to sort of freeze everyone out. Um, well, could that happen? Sure. Um, all kinds of things could happen. I and mean, you know, half the country could commit suicide tomorrow. Uh, but is it likely? Uh, is this likely to be able to abuse its power in this way? Well, the problem is, you know, cartels are unstable for all the usual reasons. That doesn't mean that it's impossible that, that a cartel succeed. After all, people have free will. Uh, but it's, uh, it's unlikely because the very incentives that lead you to form the cartel also lead you to cheat on it. Uh, because it's in the, uh, you know, it's always in the interests of, of anyone to make agreements outside the cartel once they're in it. And, uh, Brian Kaplan makes a distinction between self-enforcing boycotts and non-self-enforcing boycotts. Self-enforcing boycotts are ones where 
uh, the boycott is pretty stable because it's a boycott against, let's say for example, a boycott against doing business with people who cheat their business partners. Now, you don't have to, you know, have some iron resolve of moral commitment in order to avoid doing business with people who cheat their business partners. You have a perfectly self-interested reason not to do business with those people. But think instead of, you know, uh, not doing, do, you know, a commitment to do business, not to do business with someone because, you know, you don't like their religion or something like that, or they're a member of the wrong, you know, protection agency, one that your fellow protection agencies have told you not to deal with. Well, the boycott might work, uh, in the sense that, you know, you might be more committed to, uh, and maybe enough people might be more committed, maybe everyone in the cartel is so committed to upholding the cartel that they just won't deal with the person. Is that possible? Yes. But, uh, you know, if we assume that they form the cartel out of their own economic self-interest, if that's the, you know, then the economic self-interest is precisely what leads to the undermining because, uh, it's in their interest to deal with the person, um, uh, just it's always in your interest to engage in, uh, in mutually beneficial trade. Um, so those, anyway, so those are some of the objections and some of my replies, and I'll open it up. Well, okay, on the, on the division of labor point, uh, to the extent that the division of labor is voluntary, uh, as, uh, you know, if, if you're better at something rather than I am, and so I, you know, you do it and then I buy the services from you, as long as it's voluntary, that's fine. When we're talking about a division of labor, some people are better at ruling than other people. Well, if I consent to your ruling me, it might be just like I'm, I'm hiring you as my advisor. I think you're better at making decisions than I am, so I make sort of one last decision, which is to hire you as my advisor, um, and then from then on I, I do what you say. Um, you know, but you know that's not government. That's just you know I've, you're my employee, but you're an employee that I that I you know follow very religiously. Uh, but ruling implies ruling people without their consent, and so the division of labor doesn't seem to apply to uh, the you know that the, the, the division of labor is beneficial to everyone involved doesn't seem to apply in cases where one group is sort of forcing the other to accept its services. And on the question of, well, uh, you know, we don't, we don't see any industrialized country that has anarchy. Of course, we also don't see any industrialized country that has minarchy. Um, but then, industrialized countries haven't been around all that long. Um, and, uh, you know, and there are all sorts of, I mean, there was a, you know, there was a time when people said, uh, you know, every civilized country or, ever, or just about every civilized country is a monarchy. Um, you know, you find people in the in the 17th and 18th century saying, "Look, all the civilized countries are monarchies." Uh, you know, democracy would never work. And by democracy would never work, they meant you no, know, not just that it would have these various bad results in the long run. They just thought it would completely fall apart into chaos, you know, in a matter of months. Um, and so, uh, whatever you may think of democracy, it was more viable than they predicted. It could last longer than than they predicted. So. You know, things are in flux. There was a time when, you know, there was all monarchies. Now it's all, you know, semi-oligarchical democracies. And, um, you know, uh, the night is young. 
Yeah. Um, Robert, surely we all appreciate the wonderful work that you do here at the Mises Institute, but um, Ludwig von Mises wasn't an anarchist. So I was wondering if you could tell us more about your institute and the Molinari Institute. <laughs> <laughs> Mises wasn't really a Misesian. <laughs> Well, I have my own think tank. It is somewhat smaller than this one. Uh, I'm not sure. I'm not sure whether it has a physical size. I, um, <laughs> it it does consist of more than one person. Uh, it's, it uh, the board of directors is three people. So it, it's three people plus a website. Um, <laughs> and you know, someday it will rule the earth in a in an anarchic way. <laughs> um, Right now, mostly what it does is uh, is um, uh, I put up various uh, you know, libertarian and anarchist classics on the website. There's an offshoot of it, the Molinari Society, which is the same three people plus one more. Uh, <laughs> but uh, we, you know, we, uh, in, insofar as as Hayek said, social facts consist in in people's attitudes toward them. So the more people who think that it exists, the more it exists. So, uh, so the whole thing exists a little bit more because we got affiliated with the American Philosophical Association. So the Molinari Society is is hosting a session at the American Philosophical Association meetings in December. So you know, there it's actually going to be a uh, a Molinari event uh, in December uh, involving the three people plus another one. <laughs> um, so anyway, so that's the the grand and glorious progress. Anyway, it's, you know, it's it's um, uh, its mission is to overthrow the government. Uh, we have we've applied for uh, uh, for tax exempt status from the government. We'll see <laughs> see just how dumb they are. <laughs> well, I, I, we worded the description somewhat somewhat differently when we said in the forums. <laughs> Yes. Yes. I was going to bolster the point you made uh, about uh, the Randian objection that uh, market transactions require some sort of legal background to them. Uh, the fact that there are black markets, you know, lies to this because you can certainly, you know, if, you, if you're a cocaine dealer and you get ripped off by your uh, middleman, you certainly can't go to a court and say, you know, go arrest him. He didn't sell me. The, he didn't give me the cocaine that he was supposed. I'm sure someone's tried it, but... <laughs> now, you know, of course, this does often talk, this, you know, very easily can lead to violence, but that is also, don't forget that it's an active, there are people actively trying to stop you, not just that, you know, they're not letting you arbitrate. No, they're actively stopping you from doing it. So, you know. Yeah. And David Friedman makes the argument that one of the main functions of the Mafia is to serve as, as something like a court system for criminals. And it's not all it does, but the thing is, you know, if, if uh, you know, the, the mafia takes an interest in what sorts of criminal goings on are going on in its territory, because it wants its cut, but it also, you know, it doesn't want the, you know, gangs shooting, a, shooting a, having shootouts with each other in its territory. And if you've got a conflict, you know, you agreed to be on some kind of criminal deal with someone and they, you know, they cheated you, and it happened in the jurisdiction of some particular mafia group, well, they'll take an interest in that. and. Uh, you know, as long as you're, you know, you're providing your cut, and if they're not cooperating, they will act as something kind of court-like and police-like. So they're sort of cops for criminals. Yes. Uh, well, um, other protection companies. Uh, the, uh, um, uh, I mean, certainly once it succeeds, if it su succeeds in doing it, then it's become a government. But during the time it's, it's, it's trying to do it, it hasn't yet become a government, and so we assume that there are still, you know, other agencies around. And it's in those other agencies' interest to make sure that this doesn't happen. Uh, and, uh, so, you know, could it become a protection racket? You know, in, in principle, could protection agencies in, evolve into governments? We'll think, you know, some could, and I think probably well, historically some have. Uh, but the question is, is that sort of a likely or inevitable result? And I don't think so because there is a check and balance against it. Checks and balances can fail. In anarchy, just they can fail, you know, in constitutions. But there is a check and balance against it, which is the, 
you know, the possibility of calling in other protection agencies uh, or someone starting another protection agency before this thing has yet had a chance to acquire that kind of power. Yes? Who best explains the origin of the state? Um, well, there's a, there's a popular 19th century theory of the origin of the state that you find in a number of different forms. It's in Herbert Spencer, it's in uh, Oppenheimer, um, uh, and you find some of the uh, uh, the French uh, liberals like uh, Comte and Dumoyer and Molinari. He wasn't really French, he was Belgian. I'm not a Frenchy, I'm a Belgi. But, um, but anyway, the, uh, this theory, and they had different versions of it, but it's all pretty similar, was that uh, what happens is that one group conquers another group. Uh, often the theory was that a, um, uh, that a sort of a hunter-marauder group conquers an agricultural group. And, uh, you know, we find out, I mean, Molinari's version of it, what happens is, first they just go and, you know, <coughs> kill people and grab their stuff. And then gradually they find, they figure out, well, maybe we should wait and not, you know, not kill them because we want them to grow more stuff the next time we come back. So instead we'll just come and grab their stuff and not kill them. And then they'll, they'll grow some more stuff and next year we'll be back. And they think, well, if we take all their stuff, then, you know, they won't have enough seed corn to grow it. Or, you know, they won't have any incentive to grow it. They'll just, you know, run away or something. So we won't take everything. And the funny thing, we don't have to keep going away and coming back. We can just move in. Uh, and, uh, and then gradually over time, you know, and so you get, you get a ruling class and a ruled class. And at first they're, you know, the ruling class and the ruled class may be sort of, you know, ethnically different because there are these different tribes. But even if over time the, the tribes intermarry and there's no longer any, you know, any difference in the composition, it's still the, they've still got the same structure of a ruling group and a ruled group. So that was one popular theory of the origin of the state, or at least the origin of many states. I think another origin you can see of some states or state-like things is that, uh, is, is sort of in the same sort of situation, but in cases where they succeed in fending off the, uh, the invaders, is some local group within the invaded group says, well, we're going to specialize in defense. We're going to specialize in defending the rest of you guys against these invaders. And they succeed. Um, but, you know, now they've managed to, I mean, if you look at the history of England, I think this is what happens with the English monarchy. The early English monarchs, before the Norman Conquest, the earliest English monarchs are sort of war leaders whose main job is, is, is national defense. You know, they have very little to do within the country. They're primarily sort of directed against foreign invaders. And, uh, you know, but there, but it was a monopoly. They were sort of the monopoly. Now, the question is how they got that monopoly. I'm not so sure. But anyway, once they got it, then they, you know, they gradually started involving more and more, uh, domestic control as well. Yeah. Um, Hector, Murray's story about Hector is very much similar to this story. And it's on the web and it's just a beautiful story. Which story about Hector is this? The first one about, uh, why do we have to leave? Let's just stay there. Oh, yeah. Uh, Murray did a beautiful job on that, and I would recommend it. What's that in? Where is it, Jeff? I asked you. Yeah, it's, it's, it's on the Rothbard article. Okay, there's one of the Rothbard articles on there? Okay. I, I just remember Hector is, uh, Hector is a thief. Hector is a monster. Oh, that over our time or something like that. Yeah. Okay. I wanted to uh, buttress your thesis in several ways. Uh, one, uh, another argument against uh, in favor of anarchy is that if you really favor the government, you have to favor world government, because right now there's anarchy between governments, and we can't mm -hmm. have that. You know, we want government, and very few people favor world government, and it's incompatible mm -hmm. with the case against anarchy. Another yeah, that has to be a final, final arbiter. Right. <laughs> Another buttress is, uh, you told me about negotiation, the way that the time zones came up, and the way that uh, standard gauge for railroads came up, was through negotiation of railroad companies. Uh, other, uh, and, the, uh, and the internet. I mean, some of that, it, some of that is, is legal, but others is just you know, it's customary. Right. And then another uh, support is this thing about the cartel. At one time, the National Basketball Association had eight, only eight teams, and they wouldn't allow any other people to come in. So they started the ABA, the American Basketball Association, with a red, white, and blue ball. Mm -hmm. So if you had this cartel that wouldn't let other people in, they could start another cartel. Or another what happened to them? Well, they eventually were. Yeah, okay, yeah. Like 30 teams in the NBA. Mm -hmm. And if that's too few and they won't mm -hmm. in, then yeah. yet another league can come up. Yeah. 
Because the crucial point is, you know, the Austrian definition of competition is not number of competing firms, it's the free entry. So as long as it's possible to start another one, it's, you know, right. that can have the same uh, effect it's actually yeah, In addition to the dissolution mm -hmm. of cartels, you can have other mm -hmm. cartels competing mm -hmm. with the first cartel. Did the XFL have any good effect? <laughs> 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 I wanted to ask a question. In your answer to the first question, where you said you were appointing him as your guide, mm -hmm. does this mean you take my no. side and the alien? <laughs> no, no. That's what. That's why I said it was uh, that, that the he was the employee rather than the owner. Um, no, I, I, I believe in I believe in inalienable rights. He's an employee that you can't fire. Because no, I can't fire him. I'm just appoint, I mean, he's my advisor. I always will follow him. But yeah, but but I haven't given up my right to fire him. Yeah. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.